Dr. Leon Perman. I'm the head of the Digital Financial Services Observatory, which is a project of the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation at Columbia Business School, Columbia University uh, in New York. And uh, we're going to talk about combating cybercrime through regional resource centers. And our speakers today are Sylvia Bar Yazbek from uh, CGAP and David Medin from CGAP. Um, just a, a housekeeping note, please, if you could keep your microphone and video off, please. Um, and if you want to start asking questions, for at the, uh, for at they'll be asked at the end of the um, presentation, please send them through to the host. Um, you'll see on the list, Jason Buckbite. Um, send the questions through uh, during the course of the webinar, please. Okay, so the agenda today is... Uh, this little introduction, then we're going to go straight into the uh, the webinar and then 15 minutes uh, Q&A. Again, uh, questions via the chat box to the host. Uh, no voice questions, please. So here's the DFSO webinar team. Uh, Professor Ellie Noam is the director of CITI. Uh, that's me, Dr. Leon Perlman, Mike Wessler, research scholar, who's also um, doing tech on the webinar today, and Jason Buckfight, Executive Director of uh, CITI. And you'll see where we are there in that red arrow on the left. Uh, it's, um, it looks like a warm day, but it's actually a pretty cold day here in New York. It's winter time, um, but um, we, we, we're happy to be here. So a bit about the uh, DFS Observatory. Um, this is our website. Go take a look at it. Um, it's a huge database on um, policy and regulation around digital financial services, as well as uh, blockchain, regulatory sandboxes, cybersecurity, a whole lot of publications uh, that have been produced by the DFSO on there, a legal library, and there's also an event archive, including recordings of our previous summits and uh, webinars, as well as some quizzes you can take uh, to test your knowledge on digital finance. Uh, some of our activities, the legal, legal and regulatory database I spoke about, model laws and regulations, roundtables, commentaries and analysis of new laws, and we have close collaboration with industry regulators, academics, donors, standard setting bodies around the world, of which CGAP is um, very thankfully one of them. Okay, so just again, the uh, archive, you can uh, you can take a look at all these webinars and uh, therefore for download. Uh, save the date, please, for the annual Digital Financial Services Observatory Summit. Uh, the theme that shows decentralized finance and financial inclusion looks to be a blockbuster event. February the 7th, 2020, at Columbia University Faculty House, House here on the main campus um, of Columbia University, uh, Upper West Side of New York. So if you are coming from afar, please, uh, we'd love to have you. The um, event is on February 7th, 2020. So uh, I want to introduce our speakers, um, Sylvia and Dave from um, CGAP, both highly accomplished. Uh, Sylvia is a financial sector analyst at CGAP. Uh, she works on data protection and privacy, government to person payments, and technical guidance for CGAP members. She's worked on consumer protection and behavioral research for responsible financial services systems and regulatory frameworks. David is a senior, also a senior financial services uh, specialist within CGAP, and he's actually the lead staff member on data protection and security. Uh, he served as chairman of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board from 2013 to 2016. And prior to that, he served as senior advisor to the White House National Economic Council and was the associate director for financial practices at the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, D.C. So um, with that, I want to hand over to uh, David and Sylvia to uh, do the presentation. And ladies and gentlemen, if you uh, want to send questions through, send it to the chat box uh, to the host. So over to you, to David and Sylvia. Thanks, Leon, very much, and thanks to the Digital Financial Services Observatory for hosting this webinar. Um, just as a quick background, uh, housed at the World Bank, CGAP is a global partnership of more than 30 leading development organizations that works to advance the lives of poor people through financial inclusion. 
Using action-oriented research, we test, learn, and share knowledge intended to help people build inclusive and responsible financial systems that protect their economic gains and advance broader development goals. So one question is, uh, why does CGAP uh, care about cybersecurity and how is it important to its mission? Uh, there are five reasons. Um, the first is, uh, in order for financial inclusion to be effective, there has to be trust and confidence in the financial services being offered. If there are successful cyber attacks, uh, or even and reports of cyber attacks through the media um, or word of mouth, it can affect people's trust for these new financial systems. And once that trust has been broken, it can take years to rebuild it. Um, second is that poor people are more likely to fall victim to social engineering attacks, which is a common method that's used by cyber criminals. Uh, and why is that? Because of lower levels of literacy and numeracy uh, can make it harder for them to discern whether uh, they are being uh, tricked, trying to be tricked into providing pins or account information uh, that would, uh, or allow viruses into their system uh, that would, would cause them harm. Um, third is that poor people are least able to afford to lose money. I think that's self-evident that uh, any loss um, um, can be uh, considerable. Um, fourth, uh, I think is an important issue as a policy matter, which is in the developed world, the consumer or customer is often not liable for losses. Um, and that has two effects. One is it makes the consumer not unconcerned, but less concerned about the losses because they know that they'll be made up, say, by their credit card company. Uh, but it also importantly gives a incentive for the credit card companies um, to develop a lot of uh, protections against cyber attacks, uh, and they've shown uh, dramatic reductions in fraud over the years uh, because they have that incentive because they ultimately they bear the losses, and so therefore they're going to want to do as best they can to protect against them. In the developing world and emerging markets, oftentimes it's the case that the customer bears the loss, um, and so that again makes it more important that we adopt systemic cybersecurity protections. Uh, because, uh, again, these are customers who can least able to afford financial loss. Um, fifth and finally, uh, many of the customers in um, developing countries don't use smartphones, but instead are continuing to use feature phones and USSD channels, um, which are inherently less secure uh, than smartphones, um, oftentimes don't allow for encryption. Um, and so, again, if the technology that the consumer is using is not providing adequate cyber protection, there needs to be protections at different levels of the transaction and through the systems operated, say, by money, mobile money uh, operators. Um, so we think these are, are five reasons why it's, um, cyber protections is really critical um, to, cyber, to uh, emerging markets uh, and for consumers in them. And with that, I will turn it over to Sylvia. Thank you, David. So. Knowing why this matters, especially in the context of financial inclusion, I would like to share a little bit of data and evidence that there is actually a real threat out there, um, particularly in developing countries. Um, in the past few years, there has been a rapid increase um, of, uh, the, of cyber incidents and data breaches in in Africa, in Latin America, in East Asia Pacific, and in Southern Asia. And this is particularly, um, particularly the case in markets with higher volumes of DFS transactions. Um, for example, in Asia, markets have the highest use rates of mobile banking and digital payment applications, and at the same time, they're experiencing the highest volume of cyber attacks on financial institutions. In 2016, um, for example, there were several, there was a series of attacks um, it, on institutions in Bangladesh, Indonesia, Japan, Philippines, Taiwan, and Vietnam. And one explanation for these trends may be that cyber criminals are shifting their attention now to the less developed countries and to easier targets in DFS markets because the develop, more developed economies are really building up their defenses against cyber attack. Another explanation that we've uh, heard and that we've read about is that DFS transactions are 
carried out using insecure devices. And David was just mentioning this. Often, especially lower income populations use still basic phones or feature phones. Also, if smartphones are being used, those smartphones are not always updated to the newest operating systems. It's also not always um, the highest value and um, highest quality um, smartphones. And so they are much more likely and much more easy to be um, attacked. And the transmission lines as well um, are not designed to protect the security that is needed for financial transactions. And that makes DFS systems and DFS providers much more vulnerable. Another trend that we are seeing, especially in Africa and Latin America, is that cybercrime is on the rise. However, especially in terms of cybercriminal communities that are growing there much faster than anywhere else. But let me come once more back to the point that we both made about the vulnerabilities in a mobile financial transaction or in a DFS transaction. CGAP actually did some deeper research on that, and we uh, presented that also at a webinar um, about a year ago. So you can check out on cgap.org um, and look for that webinar, which talks about cybersecurity in mobile financial transactions. And what we found in our research is that there are at least five different ways how a criminal could intercept a mobile financial transaction. So as you can see here with the red circles, the first option or opportunity that a criminal could have is to intercept the transaction by eavesdropping into the connection between a mobile phone and a cell tower. The second option or vulnerability actually is that there is the possibility to set up fake base stations, and that's very easy. That can even be just a laptop with a USB Thick. It can be just um, launched from a mobile phone. So setting up a fake base station is pretty easy, and that way a criminal can also intercept a transaction. The third option, and that is really between, um, the again, the mobile phone and the um, network, which is the exploitation of mobile networks roaming services. So whenever you are, for example, in a different country, you will roam, right? You will run on another mobile network operator's um, network in order to use your services. And that can be exploited um, very easily by a um, criminal in order to launch an attack from anywhere in the world. The fourth probability and the fifth probability are really more about insiders, um, where insiders can collaborate with criminals or themselves um, uh, get into the system and launch attacks from inside. So I'm mentioning these just very briefly, and as I mentioned, uh, feel free to check out our website to learn a little bit more about those vulnerabilities, but also what DFS providers can do in order to address those. Now coming back to some of the trends, um, we have focused more recently more on Africa because we are seeing that Africa is really the region where the threats are highest because also the preparedness is the lowest. So the resilience of Africa's banking and mobile banking sector is re really the, the weakest. Um, for example, what we have um, seen in a study that was carried out in 2017, um, that study interviewed 700 organizations from across Africa, and they found that Africa's banking sector lost over $1 trillion um, as a result of cyber attacks in 2017. Um, in mobile banking and in uh, mobile financial transactions, the loss um, um, amounted to $140 million. Um, that was the result of SIM swaps, of social engineering, um, as well in it, as inside of fraud. Um, the review also looked at the preparedness of the banking sector, and they found that 75% of financial service providers are not employing the common security testing techniques, uh, and 60% were not keeping up to date with cybersecurity trends and attacks. 
they also found that um, three, uh, three quarters of the providers, um, excuse me, that three quarters of the vulnerabilities um, that were identified within the providers were really very basic hyper hygiene, um, like for example, mi um, missing patches, uh, fixing missing patches or updating uh, software packages that were actually the, the challenges that were identified. Pretty basic things that could easily be addressed. So the studies that are existing are pretty clear that there is a need. However, at CGAP, we wanted to learn for ourselves uh, what financial sector participants are thinking about cyber vulnerability. And so last year, we interviewed ourselves um, quite a number of representatives, um, including public, sec public sector entities, so policymakers, um, central banks, we spoke to financial service providers, both digital financial services providers as well as non-digital financial service providers like MFI, SACOs, also commercial banks. Um, we spoke also to regional networks, uh, development partners, and um, experts in the field of cyber security in, in the financial sector. And our objective was really to understand what is their perception of cyber security risks and also what are their needs what type of services are they using currently? Or where would they go if they were attacked or had an issue? And what would they really need in addition to feel um, more prepared and also safe to address a cyber uh, incident um, effectively? So our conversations confirmed that there is really a huge gap in the skills so finding people that have the ability uh, to um, review um, cyber security processes and to um, monitor the, the servers and to review how the organization can be better at protecting themselves. Um, and also there are very limited uh, cybersecurity support services. So if there was an incident, many of them said, well, we would probably go to our IT department. But then we spoke with people from the IT department and they said, well, we don't really feel prepared to address this. Uh, so there's a real gap in that area. Uh, we spoke also with policymakers, as I mentioned, and they are aware of the issue and they are, um, several of them are already working on regulatory frameworks. However, when we then spoke again to providers, they, have um, challenges because they say those frameworks that the policymakers are implementing are copied from Western countries and don't really reflect their realities. So for example, financial service provider in Rwanda shared with us that now they are required to do pen testing um, every year and they need to do an audit every two years. But the reality is that they don't have the resources and it makes it really difficult for them to comply because the services are not available. Also, the, having a CISO, the Computer Incident um, Support Officer, uh, a computer <laughs> Apologies, a computer um, information security officer um, is very difficult for them to find and the people who have those skills and the certification are very expensive. So the other thing that we've um, identified is that there is a growing interest to use and pay for cybersecurity support services if they were more specialized, specialized for digital financial services or for the specific um, processes that are in place in smaller financial institutions, um, and if they were more affordable. Um, the only thing that we found um, was a little bit among smaller providers, also MFIs and SACOs, so non-digital providers, they tend to evaluate the risk of being attacked a little bit lower since they think we don't provide digital financial services or we are so small, why should we be attacked? And therefore their cybersecurity risk is less, it's less of a priority to work on cybersecurity. But of course, once uh, an attack happens, then there is more interest to actually invest in it. Uh, which could actually be too late. So 
the respondents mentioned a few things that they think are really key for them, that they would appreciate if these were available. And one important thing is really threat information sharing, having access to information about trends, about good practices, also um, information that people can understand that are not IT experts, that management can understand and take decisions upon. Also, both representatives from the public and from the private sectors, they would welcome more public-private dialogue and collaboration to address cybersecurity risks. Um, for example, policymakers can also learn a lot from the private sector, and they could also collaborate the public and the private sector to educate and sensitize the public. So as a next step for us, it was important to look at what is already in place. And we found, for example, this map that was uh, done by the ITU about national certs, so computer incident response teams. And what we find is the biggest gaps are actually in Africa. So that confirms, again, that in Africa, there's probably the greatest need to provide support with cybersecurity resources and support. Um, also, those existing structures that are um, popping up here and there in Africa, they are often um, understaffed, have very little capacity if they are at all operational uh, already. And if they are in place and working, often they focus only on the public uh, sector and on the agencies or critical infrastructure, which is certainly um, legitimate because they have to focus on their priority sectors. Um, but this, again, confirms that for the financial service providers, there's not really a resource or somewhere they can go to if um, they have an attack. So based on though that understanding um, at CGAP, we thought about what is it that could help to address this gap? And of course, because there are so little resources, there needs to be an effort that can um, serve several countries. And so our idea is to regionalize um, a response and support. And there was basically aggregating the little supply that is available across a couple of countries as well as the demand and really also benefit from the opportunity to share information and uh, threat information and um, concerns across multiple countries because a uh, situation that happens, let's say, in Ghana might tomorrow be um, present in Nigeria and any of the other countries. So our idea of a regional cybersecurity resource center is really what tries to address this resource and capacity gap. And the idea is to really build an, on and enhance existing structures, um, skills, and technology. So not building something completely new, those regional centers would collaborate with what is already existing. There's also the idea that these centers could really promote the use of open source software. Um, at the moment, uh, providers need to pay a lot of money to um, get software. Also, we heard in several of our conversations that they would love to get some guidance on which software should I buy and which one is it worth investing in. And it's not always the case that the most expensive one is the best one and that they might actually invest in something that is not really useful. It is also important that these resource centers are inclusive. So the pricing needs to be fair. It needs to be proportional to what a provider can pay. And a small provider might not need to pay as much as a big provider. Another opportunity that we see of those regional centers is to collaborate with universities. And in order to develop talent, offer um, internship opportunities, um, collaborate with them also for research and to build the next generation of cybersecurity experts. Um, the regional centers for the regional um, nature, of course, can then also connect with the international cybersecurity community. Um, and they can offer a platform for innovating and testing, um, including also of innovative solutions for security in the financial sector. And last 
Lastly, um, they could provide also a platform for public prior dialogue and collaboration. But I want to get into the details of the cybersecurity centers um, on the next slide, um, because we have been thinking about how this could look like. And so the idea is to have really a three-leveled approach. Now, I was talking about regional centers, and they would really be kind of the umbrella, what you see on top in blue. It's a regional support center that covers several um, sub-regions. So let's say the regional one could be for all of Africa. A sub-regional center could then be for a small part of Africa, let's say West Africa. And then we have also local presence. Now at the regional level, um, as you can also see it here, there is really more focus on strategic um, advisory, um, advisory around how to um, develop a policy. There's also much more around information sharing, what are recent trends, what are good practices, um, and also research and dialogue would really be at this upper level, as well as capacity building. At the next level, at a sub-regional level, this would be kind of a cybersecurity response center. A little bit something that usually C certs and certs are doing, but at a sub-regional level, so across a couple of countries, in order to aggregate those um, services. And so here is really where the threat intelligence is being developed and shared. There's crisis management, um, operational advisory, really more technical um, advisory to providers, and then also training, but more specialized training courses. And in our research, we realized that for providers as well as policymakers, it's still very important to have some proximity. And proximity to have someone who is on the ground in your country is also important for trust, especially if we think about the services that a security operations center provides. So a security operations center is um, a monitoring service of the activities in the server. And there, there's a lot of concern that data would maybe flow out of the country. And so that's why we realized that still needs to be on the ground, especially for building trust. And so there will be still local entities that are managed by the sub-regional center, but that then really provide on the ground support and also the 24-7 um, security monitoring and um, country level threat sharing. Now, I want to show this again in a different picture. This is not a full picture where you think about, okay, there are several sub-regions, and so there could be one um, structure for West Africa or Francophone Africa, one structure for English uh, Anglophone Africa, like in Eastern Africa, and maybe a third one. So this is just like a rough sketch of how this could actually then look like as a full structure. And again, I want to show it more visually um, now with a map. So the idea is that there might be the hub, right? The regional cybersecurity resource center is the blue uh, circle that you see now, right now located in Rwanda, just as an example. And then they will actually spread out and connect to the sub-regional centers and the local operation centers. Now, as we are thinking through the business model of this, one thing that we've also heard in our conversations, and CGAP actually organized together with GIZ and the Luxembourg government a workshop uh, two weeks ago during the European Microfinance Week to discuss with development partners, funders, and also um, industry networks and policymakers the idea of regional cybersecurity resource centers. And the feedback that we've received is really the key thing that we need to think through is trust. How will people, providers, and governments trust the center to do a good job and to be confidential? And so something that we can learn from the financial sector ISACs or from the GSMA Fraud and Security Forum is that what works really well is to build trust communities. And trust communities can be achieved by having both closed and open fora. 
So closed fora are really to exchange very sensitive data with trusted peers. Um, that means like only the financial service providers, or maybe there's even just the community among DFS providers. Um, and then there are open fora that allow also others to join, and these are really more to exchange anonymized information and best practices. We've also learned that it's really important to have regular physical meetings, um, and that is actually something what the Regional Cybersecurity Resource Center or the sub-regional centers could take on, um, be building working groups um, amongst a couple of players that they can work on specific issues. So this really helps also to build um, more trust and to build a community. An important consideration is the participation of policymakers. And speaking to policymakers, we know they dearly need those services as well. And still, there is a little bit of reluctance from the private sector, of course, to share information with the policymakers. And that is why, really, that um, information sharing platform needs to be neutral. It needs to be a neutral, trusted uh, player. And so the idea is that then there will be fora where really the financial service sector can exchange amongst themselves without a policymaker knowing, whereas the policymakers, they will be informed of the higher level trends and concerns that are in their sector. They can also, through that platform, learn from the industry and see what is going on. And they can gather important information to protect themselves. I think that is also a very important uh, consideration for us to take, that policymakers struggle themselves to keep their system secure. So overall, um, the regional cybersecurity centers can really be more that neutral player. And at that level, as we go also back to the slides before, as you can see here again, the services that are at the regional level are really less associated with very sensitive data. This is really more higher level information. And so at that level, there can really be more broad exchange and it is, can really be a, a public good. So I just see, I think we were missing a slide, but that's no problem. I will just talk to you about it. Another important and last aspect that I uh, think is important for us to share and to think through is, of course, the business model. Is that at all feasible? Um, setting up a regional, sub-regional structure will, of course, come with certain costs, especially capital costs to set it up. And so right now here at CGAP, we are thinking through what could be the business model and how could this look like to make something like this viable, but also sustainable um, to run in the long term. And our initial um, assessment and analysis uh, shows that these centers can actually little by little become um, quite self-sustainable. They will re uh, require initial financing from funders and investors in order to set up the regional structure. Um, also, some initial invest investments, they can help to smooth the operations during the first few years um, until the project can gain footage and a broader client base. They will need really strong support at the start, um, but then they can be increasingly financed through a membership fee so there can be a biannual membership fee as well as an annual membership fee that can be adjusted again to the capacity and uh, to the types of services that a provider would like or a government would like. Um, and that will more and more feed into um, the revenues and then into the operating model of the centers. The Sub-regional centers, which are the response teams, they will really live mostly off um, the membership fees and the advisory fees that they receive from providers. And 
they might only need at the beginning some support and subsidization, um, which can be supported again through funders um, or investors, just to get the ball rolling, to build a trust, and also um, for providers that don't necessarily have the capacity to um, pay a full membership fee. But all in all, the idea is that these can really become self-sustainable probably after three to five years. And with that, I would like to take it, uh, give it back to Leon um, with some questions. Maybe before that, let me just share with you that there are a couple of additional resources that CGAP has developed. Um, first of all, we have uh, paper that we developed together with GIZ that you can find online, and uh, the webinar that I mentioned already, some blogs, and um, additional uh, background material that you can find on cgap.org. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia and David. That was, uh, that was pretty comprehensive. Um, a lot of food for thought in terms of what's required um, to be to create these collegial bodies for um, sharing risk and information. Um, we have a few questions that have come through. Um, first one is from Patrick Slattery, uh, who asks, what are your thoughts on designing the regional local structure in a way that can be dynamically reconfigured in the event of a disruptive event? Can you repeat that one more time? Okay. Uh, from Patrick, what are your thoughts of designing the regional or local structure in a way that can be dynamically reconfigured in the event of a disruptive event? So I assume the disruptive event is some uh, national threat or even um, a, a uh, threat to the, to the resource itself, the resource center. Yeah. Well, I think it depends a little bit on what that um, event would be, right? Um, on First of all, I think what is important to understand that those centers don't need much physical presence because everything is virtual nowadays. So even such a center would probably just be a couple of computers with a couple of um, engineers. So in terms of a kind of national natural disaster or maybe the inability to continue working in a certain country, I think that physical location could be moved fairly quickly. Um, also, the concept itself is already pretty dynamic by, and flexible by having these different pieces and the different levels. So if there is an issue, let's say, at the, at the country level, and that cannot be addressed by the local um, security operations center, then they can escalate that issue to the sub-regional center. And if they also can't address it, then they can, again, escalate it to the regional center or maybe to another sub-regional hub. So I think because it is like that multifaceted structure, it can be very agile, and there will always be backups if one uh, system doesn't work anymore. But maybe one more point is clearly that it, the center where it is and where it operates will require strong support from the local government and local stakeholders. And so before a center will be implemented, there need to be a lot of stakeholder consultations, and it's important to build the buy-in of the local, uh, local sector. And just to add, uh, I think Patrick raises a very good point about um, uh, what would happen if there was an attack or something that took out some of the centers is that this is really an advantage over having each country having its own facilities because now we have redundancies uh, both at the local, regional, and maybe even continent-wide continent level. Um, so this actually is, it makes it a more powerful system where you can shift from one center to another to, to get uh, assistance and escalate to the highest levels uh, in, a, in the event of a serious attack. Yeah, uh, to that point, Patrick had uh, sent some follow-ups. Um, which I think you've addressed. Uh, you want to know if the communication channel, channels can be rerouted, and I think you've, you've addressed that. Um, or for that matter, it could be a matter of an earthquake or some other natural disaster. 
uh, but I, I think the, the, the handoff and the redundancy that you spoke about would adequately cover that. Um, okay, a question from Bernardo Baradas. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Thank you. Considering the lack of qualified cybersecurity experts in the developed world, um, do you have any thoughts? I suppose it should be developing world, but developed world, do you have any thought strategies to keep in the country? Any trade staff, for example, uh, in your work with universities in Africa? So, in other words, is there, is there a pipeline of cybersecurity experts that you would train within academic institutions in, in Africa or in the developing world? Uh Absolutely, this is a very important point and uh, we have already had a couple of conversations with universities and with other teams that are actually very active in looking at how to build the next uh, generation of IT uh, experts, or maybe the first generation of IT experts. Um, and then also the question is about retaining them, right? And so what we see the centers could do, they could really be also collaborating very closely with universities or with uh, schools as well and offer um, young people the opportunity to um, test their skills and work with the center, do some research or actually also support the center. This will A, make the services of the center more um, efficient, cost efficient by using young talent, but also uh, provides an opportunity for young people to uh, get a job and to learn by doing. So there's a lot of consideration and actually in the pro project details, we have been really thinking about how to build in a technical training component into this and a deep collaboration with universities across Africa. Okay, great, David. Any, anything with you? Okay. Um, so so I, I, yeah, I would just, just add that, I mean, this is, this is a problem around the world is the lack of human resources on the cyber. And, uh, and for, for better or worse, um, there are very attractive financial offers to go to other parts of the world uh, to provide services. And what we're hoping is through these partnerships with the universities, we can dramatically increase the number of cybersecurity experts and computer scientists um, and just uh, by virtue of that, having at least some and hopefully many um, stay in their home countries or in their region uh, to provide these valuable services. So uh, I think if we can really increase the number of people who have local ties, that there's at least an increased chance that they will stay where they are. Okay. Um, thanks. Just, just as an FYI, uh, you're probably all aware that um, the uh, TFS Observatory is busy building a actual risk management framework for cybersecurity in digital finance and finance in the in the um, in the uh, developing world or developing world focus. Uh, so, in, in some small measure, uh, these webinars um, and the the, um, the events that we hold hold are a component of the capacity building that you spoke about to possibly just initially raise awareness that um, there's a cybersecurity gap and to raise awareness of all the cybersecurity threats uh, that there are um, uh, insofar as digital finance. Um, okay, so a question from uh, Sophia in Nairobi is, what is the sequence of notification to the regional center of an event and who responds to that and how? So I understand she's asking that if there is a cybersecurity event, who would actually respond to it first? So yeah, yeah there, I, there, I, as I understand it, is um, how, how is the the center notified? Is it manually? I mean, I'm assuming this is what the question is. Uh, is it manual? Is it some sort of automatic notification? Mm -hmm. And what, what's the feedback loop to actually not just be notified about, but somebody actually action it and respond to it? Uh, to, to prevent ongoing harm? So there are two options. One is that a provider is actually using the cyber, uh, the, the security operations center. So in that case, um, an incident or an abnormality will actually be detected by the SOC. Um, and then it will be escalated and automatically they will um, work on that. 
Now, but if you have an incident and you have a situation, um, now whether you have the SOC with the center structure or not, you can also, there can be a way of calling a number, um, there could be also um, a way that you have an online community where you can actually just go into the uh, website and press a button, but maybe your internet doesn't work anymore, so a, a phone line would actually be more useful. Uh, so I guess that is probably the way how one could reach out to the center and to the structure. Now, what, with regards to the escalation process, the idea is really that an incident or a situation is first of all identified locally, but if the local team that might not be as specialized or not as high qualified um, can't address that, then it will be escalated to a second instance, which mm -hmm. is the sub-regional um, response team. And if that response team also has challenges, then they have also a connection to an international network where they can then escalate it to the regional center or even higher to a center that is sitting, for example, in Luxembourg or in another country with very high um, qualified and um, capacity, high capacity um, IT centers that can then support. Yeah, and just to add, uh, um, Sophia's question, and thanks to Sophia and others who are on late uh, on a Friday um, to just join in the webinar, but put that some of the economic efficiencies, which is you don't have to have replicate the complete array of services in every single location. You can have uh, a, a limited operation at the local level to handle the everyday issues that come up and not have, not have to be fully prepared for everything that could possibly come up, but then if there's a more challenging problem, escalate it to the sub-region sub or to the region uh, as well. And so it, it, it let, allows some, some economic efficiencies at the local level, and not especially where there are smaller economies, um, to support um, at the activities that make the most sense on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, just, just in terms of the, the business model, um, uh, again, is uh, are the, the smaller providers who who might even be the most uh, susceptible to attacks. Um, is there a, a, how shall I put this a subsidization to to allow them to connect? I mean, some of them don't even have CISOs. Some of them don't even CTOs. Uh, but they might be the source of a, an attack as we move from uh, what I would call interoperability to uh, further integration into payment systems. Um, how do you enable the smaller um, providers to plug in? Is probably what I'm asking. Yeah, so the idea is that there will be subsidization for smaller players. And for example, this is also something that can be learned or that is working pretty well in the FSI sec. There is also a membership fee that is more proportional to the size um, of a provider. And there is there are opportunities where uh, one can cross-subsidize by having bigger providers or some that can pay more and there will provide also smaller providers um, uh, an affordable uh, service that is uh, proportional to their capacity. And the other thing is that funders can really come in here to also support and subsidize. It might even be the government that is willing to subsidize or a central bank that actually is willing to subsidize because a central bank sees the systemic risk of it, right? And for them, even if it's just one single player because it is connected to the bigger financial system through, let's say, for example, a national switch, they will be very keen and interested that even the smallest providers in their sector are being protected. And so there can even be something from a government level to subsidize the services that everybody is um, secured. And actually an example is um, from Nigeria where we spoke with the national switch um, and they said that everybody who connects to the switch has to comply with certain security requirements. And so it doesn't really matter um, how big or small you are, you have to comply to certain um, security measures because it could affect the larger system. And um, also in our conversations with funders, there is interest in supporting this because it's not only at a national level, um, it's systemic at an international level. 
Right, and we also uh, have recognized through our conversations that it's going to be important. The startup costs are going to have to be probably funded by uh, foundations or governments. Uh, that is the initial capital expenses and initial hiring uh, until to get the centers up and running and prove themselves and then develop a customer base. Um, so there's this hurdle where you know lending could come in maybe from the World Bank to countries to support the operations, uh, but the planning stage and the initial investment to get things going is going to require some funder help. Yeah, and from our conversations with experts um, that have already been working on such a model and that are running a small cybersecurity center in Senegal, they say the first investment is big because you need, let's say, three or five um, security experts that do the job, but then to add new customers to the center, it doesn't require that many more resources. So you can already do a lot with a couple of panels and uh, displays and security experts. So it is really um, slow in raising the, the costs. Are there more fixed costs? And the variable costs are not that much. Uh, and uh, earlier, Sylvia mentioned open source software, and this really provides an opportunity for developing countries to leapfrog the developed world and, develop, and creating new and innovative solutions to cyber threats that, that don't rely on standard off-the-shelf software, but it can be collaborative uh, and uh, updated on a, uh, as threats evolve. And so this is really a, an opportunity to be efficient um, and creative uh, in countries that, that are currently lacking in resources. Okay, uh, uh, just an associated question. Um, Johannes in Johannesburg wants to know if this is aimed only at financial sector um, participants or uh, expanded to say telecom um, components or anything else that much might uh, be subject to a, a cybersecurity attack? Well, uh, almost everyone is subject and vulnerable to cybersecurity attacks, but from CGAP's point of view, our focus is on uh, financial inclusion efforts, uh, but they aren't, those aren't limited to financial institutions because, as we know, uh, telecom operators offer off of mobile money services. Um, and so we think we would paint with a broad brush. We're clearly, I think, the core financial services sector would probably be most interested in these uh, types of services, central banks, um, smaller, mid-sized banks who don't, don't currently have adequate resources. But I think mobile money operators and telecom operators, I think, um, over time could be quite interested. In, and then some of these services could be expanded in the country to other sectors as well. The health sector um, has tremendous needs for cybersecurity protections. Um, and so this could be a starting point to build on a larger infrastructure. Yeah, all to replicate it even for another sector and then have a collaboration at the sub-regional or regional level between different sectoral uh, structures. A little bit similar to the ISECs, right, where you also have sectoral ISECs. Or in some countries, you have sectoral certs, like a financial cert, a telco cert. So there could also be then such a replication for another sector and then collaboration. Okay. Um, you, you, um, we've got a question from Sashin in New Delhi um, on the role of regulators, but uh, you, you touched on and uh, rephrase his, his, his question um, in relation to um, sometimes for competitive reasons, uh, there's a lack of sharing of, of data. Uh, in other words, people don't want to announce, if you will, in air quotes, that they've been hacked for, for whatever reason or have had a compromise. Um, so, so Shin's question is on the role of regulators. Should these centers be mandated? The, the um, uh, uh, probably yes, in a way. I mean, I think one of the challenges regulators face um, uh, around the world is that they have a lot of especially financial regulators, is they've got a lot of background experience on safety and soundness and prudential regulation and not so much on how to regulate on cyber. And so just as an aside, one thing the cyber centers could do is to help educate regulators about the appropriate approach to regulation of cyber uh, that takes into account the ever-changing nature of the threat. And also keep, keeps in mind that uh, regulators have valuable sensitive information themselves that needs to be protected. So not only do the entities that they supervise uh, have to protect themselves, but the regulators have to protect themselves 
uh, as well. But certainly one could envision over time regulators mandating some participation in these centers, which would make sure that there was a consistent level of protection uh, in their countries. Yeah, and to build the communities for threat sharing, right? Um, the more people who share their situation, who share their concerns, who share threats, the better the protection can be of the whole sector. And, and I think the question also points out that there are some great, uh, competitive concerns about this, but also, quite honestly, entities don't typically want to tell their regulator where they've had a problem. Um, and so one potential solution, at least in some instances, is the anonymization of some of the threat information, that you don't always need to know um, too much about the company, but you may need to know a lot more about the virus or Trojan horse that is being distributed. And so there are, are ways of sharing and getting feedback on and warning others uh, in an anonymized fashion. Okay, and I think we have one last question. Uh, one last question is from Farouk in Lahore, um, and it's kind of a, um, a adjacent question on what type of regulation should be involved if there is. Should it be principles or rules-based regulation, um, and should cybersecurity rules be placed separately or in an operational risk framework? Um, the, 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 questions. Yeah, I think it's, those are good questions. I, I mean, I guess our general approach has been it should be principle-based, not specifics, because um, the threats are constantly evolving, the technology is changing, um, and you may get a false sense of comfort if you have encryption to a certain level or you use a certain type of firewall uh, when there's a whole new threat that doesn't and, and makes the, renders those ineffective. Um, and so having a constant assessment of your vulnerabilities and risks and then remediate against those and then repeat and do that over and over again is really the best way and not having very specific um, immutable rules. And once things are regulations, uh, they, they're very hard to change. And so uh, putting the burden on the provider, and it really varies. Small providers have different concerns than large ones. Uh, some have very different business models. Um, so you really want to tailor their protections to the nature of the way they do business. Uh, that's definitely fair. Um, I think we've come to the end, um, and I want to thank everybody for participation, especially Sylvia and uh, David for your superb uh, presentation and the insights into into your research. I hope uh, Columbia uh, University at the DFSO and I um, we, we look forward to collaborating you with, with you further. Uh, and for everybody that uh, joined us, thank you again for doing so, especially those who, who um, stayed up late. I know there were some issues apparently with the chat box, but we did get a fair amount of questions in nonetheless, so thank you for those who did um, provide questions. So again, um, save the date, the annual DFSO Summit on Decentralized Finance and Financial Inclusion on uh, February 7, 2020 at Columbia University, New York. We'd love to see you. Go to dfsobservatory.com for further details. Thank you very much. Silver and David and everybody else, and have a good day wherever you are in the world. Thank you as well. Thanks.